Hey guys, Shonzi Phillips here. Look at my September 20th DVD update. By talking about the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so. Like I always say, if you guys enjoy these DVD Blu-ray updates, definitely give this video a thumbs up. Please leave me comments below. Would love to hear what you guys thought about the titles I checked out in this update. And let me know some future titles you'd like to see me do reviews of. And some titles that you guys have picked up recently as well. Uh, now the first one I got from um, Universal and... And to me, this is, you know, I saw this one in theaters as well. And this is one of my top favorite movies of the year. You know, I like these kind of movies that are like kind of, you know, not not, not that many people see or are kind of like sort of undiscovered. Um, just the whole vibe of this movie is like really the kind of movie that I like to watch. And it's The Signal. And this is pretty much about these kids that are, um, you know, somebody, there's like this hacker and they're, you know, following him and trying to trace him. You know, they believe they found, like, the, the track to this guy who's been messing around with them. He's kind of like a troll kind of guy. He's been causing him all kinds of problems. So they end up, you know, discovering where the guy is and tracking him out into the middle of the desert. Get out to the middle of the desert, and there's something very strange about this place. They don't see anybody there. It's this weird abandoned um, house, and um, all of a sudden, weird things start to happen, and the main kid ends up waking up in this very, very strange kind of hospital-type environment. No one's telling him where his other two friends, you know, his, his girlfriend, his other friend is. Um, you know, it's Lawrence Fisberg is like the head of this whole place. And, you know, he, he, no one's telling him anything about it. And it's just something very strange about it. Everything has this kind of weird look to it, this real hyper-clean kind of odd, dated kind of vibe to it, like looks sort of like old technology in this kind of hospital place. Stuff that looks like it doesn't really even work. And it's there's just something very odd about it. And it's about sort of about him here and then what he starts to discover about this place and when he eventually, you know, leaves the place and what's around. And I, I just really... The, the, the movie, to me, works so well. You know, Lin Shea has a little part in this movie as well. Um, I just really like this. The main guy in this is, um, you know, from the movie The Giver and a bunch of different movies lately. But this is one I would really recommend for everybody out there to check this one out. Like I said, I really love this movie. I thought that it worked so well. It has deleted scenes on here, um, behind the scenes and a commentary. But to me, this was just such an effective movie. And like I said, it's one of my top favorite movies this year so far. And, would you know, you this is just one I cannot recommend enough to check this one out. Uh, the next one... I don't want to ruin too much about it because I don't know if they're actually like, you know, from the title you kind of know, but it's called Where the Legend Reborn, and it's pretty much about, in the beginning of this movie, these, uh, this family's out camping in the middle of the woods, and, um, you know, they are all attacked, and, the, and, you know, the kid's killed, the husband's killed, the wife ends up living, and it's totally messed up, and she's a total wreck, and she says, you know, they believe it was an animal that did it, and she's like, no, he had huge hands, and all this kind of stuff, so they, they start kind of a manhunt to try and find the guy, end up finding the guy, and he's this really gigantic guy, who's real hairy, and like, creepy looking, and weird acting to himself, and it's kind of about this woman who's kind of working with the police to kind of talk to him and try and figure out, like, if it was him who did it, because they really, it's kind of hard to put together the evidence, and because the way that people were killed really seems like an animal, and they really don't understand how this guy, there's any possibility this guy could have done this, and it's kind of a new take on, you know, I'm not going to, like I said, not going to talk too much about it, um, I thought it was pretty effective, though. I thought, you know, there was some kind of peculiar CGI blood in it, which I don't know why for some of it that they did that, but it was a different take on this type of film. Um, I thought it worked pretty well. I, I, I mean, I didn't end up bored with it, and I was interested in it, because in some movies, you know, you get really bored with it. It is funny, though, it's, it's only on DVD for those wondering. Uh, the next one, there's also a two-pack of this with both films. I already have the first one, so I was fine with this, uh, just having the second. Uh, but, you know, this is one that I have been waiting, you know, to come to Blu-ray forever. And I've actually been waiting for it to actually have features because when it first came out, I remember when the first movie came out, it was like one of the first times I'd ever seen a DVD that had these kind of advanced features. It had like the commentary where they drew on the screen, you know, and all these kind of stuff on it. The menu was amazing. I still keep the original first DVD of it just because I always have like these fond memories of seeing that memory, like the the, the screen and seeing like what they were doing with DVDs. And it's Ghostbusters 2. And, um, you know, this is like one that I have grown up with. 
I actually saw this one in the theaters. It kind of, you know, ages me a little bit. Um, I remember leaving my teddy bear in the theaters. I, was, I mean, I was a little kid. A lot of people don't remember when they were young, you know, when they were like three and four. For some reason, I remember a lot of it. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I have a giant head or what it is, but I remember a lot of that. I remember I was eating at uh, Hardy's, Hardy's Roy Rogers before. Don't eat those places anymore these days. But, you know, it led to but I was eating at, you know, Hardy's or Rogers, and I remember leaving the teddy bear that I brought everywhere as a kid, and I always have that memory of that, and then, you know, I've seen Ghostbusters before, I remember walking back into it, and I think I was, I don't know if I left the teddy there, or was late seeing Ghostbusters 2 because of it, I actually saw Ghostbusters 1 as well, because I think they re-released it in theaters around the same time the second one came out, so I remember very well seeing this, but this is like, the, you know, picks up right after the second one, I think it's like five years later, I believe that's what it is, five or six. And then it's like them and the, the villain in this is the you know character in the painting, Vigo. And I also love Janusz, Janusz, that character in the movie. Like, I, you know, I know some people don't love the sequel as much, but to me, I love this. I actually like, I've watched this one more than I've watched the first one. It's just, oh, to me, I just always love everything about this. The whole vibe, the whole slime aspect of the movie, especially the, I remember how scared I was with the stuff, with the train. Like, I can't say enough things about this movie. This one I really like, and it has new features on here, a new uh, round table discussion with uh, Dan Aykroyd and Ivan Reitman, and um, the On Our Own music video with Bobby Brown, which I don't think I had seen in like 10, 15 years. So actually to see that again, it's so cheesy, but I always love that. And the deleted scenes, there was actually some cool stuff on that. There was some stuff with Rick Moranis on there that I really liked. But definitely check this out Like if you don't have this. It's also in 4K. Looks really good. They did a great job cleaning this one up. And the next one from Lionsgate is another one, which I would say is one of my top movies of the year so far that I really liked. And it's the Guy Pierce Robert Patterson film, The Rover. And it's pretty much the, the whole society and the whole world is pretty much collapsed. They don't talk about too much of it in the movie. They kind of just leave it up to you, kind of wondering what exactly happened to the degree of it. But you know that... Pretty much it's like almost like the road warrior world, except for all that. It's not like that stuff going on. It's just pretty much people all depressed and there's hardly anyone around. It's, it's, you know, it's filmed in Australia. It takes place in Australia. And Guy Pierce is this guy who's like living out and doesn't look very happy. You see him at the end of the movie. He's at this bar and these other people are racing away from somewhere, end up screwing up their car and then go and steal Guy Pierce's car. And, you know, he ends up going, you know, after taking their screwed up car. And the whole movie is pretty much about him going after these people and that he really wants his car. And it's, that's pretty much the concept of, of the movie. And along the way, the kind of people that he comes across, which are some very, very strange, terrible kind of people that he comes across, like the kind of stuff that they're doing and the way this world has become from this collapse is just horrible. But I think this movie too, the outcome and the reasoning behind everything is such an effective thing. Guy Pierce's, um, gets, you know, comes along with him basically by force because he's the brother of, um, the ones who, you know, took his car and there can, he was injured and he's kind of traipsing along, you know, Guy Pierce brings him along and forces him to take him to where the brother lives and it's kind of like the journey to get back and to get the car back. But like I said, there's just a, it, it, the meaning to it and when you find out everything about it and what everything means, I thought that it worked so well. I saw some people that said that they were a little bit bored by it. To me, I didn't get bored by this at all. I, I like these kind of movies when they work, when they're a character uh, study piece and, you know, where they really work well and well acted, which this was. And on here it has um, um, the making of the film featurette. But check this one out. I really like this. Uh, the next one, a lot of people have, you know, asked me to talk about this one. And this is from, you know, Dark Sky MPI. And it's uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And this is the 40th Anniversary Collector's Edition Blu-ray. And this is the four disc one. There's two different ones. There's one that has um, one disc Blu-ray, but that one doesn't have the new features on it. But here's a look at the, the cover to it. I really like that you're seeing more companies go with like drawn covers again. I like to see that coming back again. Because I always remember as a kid in Blockbuster seeing all those kind of drawn covers. You know, Shout Factory's doing them, is, you know, started doing them, and that's what kind of is bringing people to do them again. But on here, it's got a bunch of new features on here. Uh, new, new deleted scenes and outtakes, which are silent. You know, they don't have the audio anymore to them. Interviews with, um, you know, the actor who played Grandpa. The Horrors Hallowed Ground, which is from, from a number of years back. It's Sean Clark has done a uh, number of those going to, you know, the locations and things like that. I always love that kind of stuff. 
But a lot of people ask me too about, um, you know, what I wanted to see inside of it. So a little look inside of what the case is. Here's like the artwork inside, the pictures, um, and the disc. Here's what the disc looks like. But um, I thought that they did a really, really good job cleaning this up. You know, to me, uh, oh yeah, that's not right. To me, the main uh, thing about it that really stood out to me is the difference because this is the 4K version. Is I thought it was much more uh, of a the colors, the much more vibrant colors to it, and that was the main thing. It was, you know, some of the scenes when I was looking back on the old Blu-ray were a little bit more washed out, and I feel like this one they had a lot more color to it, and you you could see the difference with it. It's not like some people will say it's not the hugest difference, but like I said, it's more it, with the saturation and that kind of stuff that I thought was was fixed better in this edition of it. Um, so I, especially if you guys don't have this set, I would definitely check this out. But the movie is basically about a group of these friends who are going to, um, you know, out in Texas, and they're going to see the, one of their properties that their the one's father, you know, owns, and they've never really been to it. And when they go out there, you know, in the beginning of the movie, you see that there's these grave robins going around in the area and very weird people. But these guys end up, the kids end up picking up this hitchhiker who's very strange, end up getting out there, you know, to the house, and, you know, pretty much, you know, leather faces in the house nearby and you know pretty much you know what's going to happen to them but this is just such an effective movie too that the movie too was shot 60 millimeter so it's supposed to have grain you never it's just not going to look like a super hd movie the whole point is to kind of have that real gritty vibe to it but i would definitely check this out you know and i think it's definitely worth picking up i thought the 4k was a very good job on it this is another one that a lot of people have been asking me about. The picture on it, it's from Anchor Bay, and it's Silent Night, Deadly Night. This is the original uncut version on Blu-ray. Uh, this has a new commentary on here as well with um, the writer and composer. Um, but, you know, I thought this looked good. A lot of people are saying stuff about it looks like it's um, an up-converted version or something like that, but... The thing is, too, they, this is like a restored version. Even on the DVD, they ended up putting in the cut scenes, and they were taken from, I think, almost like a VHS quality or really low-res edition. So you, the, the low-res stuff that they cut in is even more noticeable since the movie's in HD because it goes between them. But a lot of the shots, especially near the end, I thought really did look HD. I did not see it, to me, looking like an up-converted thing at all. I thought that it was looked pretty good. I mean, the best that I've ever seen it look. But the movie is basically about, in the beginning of this movie, this kid goes to see his grandfather who's in the old folks' home uh, with his parents, and the grandfather basically is, doesn't talk or anything, and the parents leave the room, and he says that Santa's going to punish him for being naughty, and that same night they're driving back, and this Santa who recently just robbed the liquor store and killed the guy ends up, you know, pulling them over, killing the whole family, except the, the baby in the back and, there, and the one kid, and he witnesses the whole thing. And, you know, years later, he's, you know, put into an orphanage, and the nuns, are, the one nun there is very abusive. And, you know, he basically, it's kind of about what happens to him when he turns 18 and starts working at this toy store, and when he pretty much eventually cracks up, and then he, what he ends up doing. But this is a really, to me, a f fun slasher film. Uh, Linnea Quigley is in this movie. This just works so well. It's just a really fun watch movie. And a lot of people, though, when this first came out, I remember seeing documentaries and stuff about this, how they really hated this because it was so mean-spirited about Christmas and, like, what was going on. There's also the other one, Christmas Evil, which, you know, is if you want to watch two Christmas movies, watch this and then watch Christmas Evil, which I don't know which one was first. I think this one was first, though. Uh, the next one from Anchor Bay is way, well, is, um, Grave Halloween. I just finished watching this. This is about, um, a group of exchange students who are going to school in Japan, and they end up wanting to do a documentary about the suicide forest in Japan, where people go out there and kill themselves, and there's been, you know, it's a real place, and, you know, real life. This was actually, it wasn't filmed there for real, it was actually filmed in Canada, but, um, uh, this is where they basically want to do this thing about this, because the one's mother... Um, had actually killed herself there, and they, so they have a kind of a connection to it. But when they go out there, bad things start happening. They start seeing things, and people start getting, you know, there's basically just creepy things going on in this woods. I thought this was pretty good. Um, not absolutely amazing or anything. The director of this, though, did um, The Spit on Your Grave and then Spit on Your Grave 2, which I like both of those movies. I mean, I thought the second one, though, was so, such a brutal movie, but I like both of them. Like I said, I thought this one was pretty well done. Um, it was kind of a mix of, like, with, you know, 
with the, with the horror aspect of it. They did a pretty good job giving it that kind of Asian horror vibe to it as well. Now, the next ones, I only have discs of these, but these are from Anchor Bay. They sent the discs, and it's the bone, you know, from the Halloween set, and it's the um, the bonus disc, and then part five, the producer's cut. I'm just going to put them in the old ones. At some point, I may get the set, but these are the two main big things on it, besides, I think, H2O, and I think some of the other ones have sporadic new extras, but, um, you know, Halloween 5, the producer's cut, and so I, I don't even remember if I, I hardly remember the fifth one. I know that Paul Rudd was in it, and that was the big thing about it. I liked it, but it, the uh, producer's cut, I thought it was interesting, though, but I don't absolutely love part five. Like, to me, my favorite one's The Watcher, you know, the first one, and then the third one. I absolutely love the third one. But the, you know, the Proust cut looks great. Um, you know, I think that's the only way you can get it in, is in the big set. So if you want to see that cut, I would definitely recommend checking it out. But it's kind of about this cult and um, this crazy weird cult and then Michael Myers, Myers is back. And I, I liked it, but I, I, I can't get, you know, without having the thing, I can't t talk too much about it. But the complete set, too, it basically has features for part four, five, I think in six on it, which are like making ofs, which are like 45 minute to an hour documentaries. So well done with, you with interviews with the cast and crew. The one thing I like though on part five though is they talk about to Daniel Harris. Now this is part six, I mean, sorry. But part six, and they talk about how, why Daniel Harris wasn't in the one and kind of her whole story. Really loved that feature. That was a pretty interesting story about what they did to her and everything. I, I liked just hearing about her reasoning for not being in it and what had happened. But um, this one has also a whole bunch of horrors, ho ho hollow grounds with Sean Clark, um, which is pretty cool. And they tour, the, you know, they go around with a group of people and um, look at on like a bus tour of Halloween. I really like that. Um, there's also ones, you know, showing the Halloween location and the hedge and all that kind of stuff. Um, the next one from um, Warner Brothers is Disaster LA. And this one I had not heard much about. It's a um, directed video one, so it kind of came out of nowhere. But it's a pretty cool zombie movie. It's about... You know, all set in L.A., and then one day they hear on the news that, you know, there was some kind of a attack or something has exploded, and and it's basically making people go crazy and become like zombies and start flipping out. So it's kind of a fast zombie movie, but it's about the people who are at a party. Uh, I think they they left the party, but then the next morning they're back together. But they're basically trying to survive together and trying to basically find a way to get out of the city, you know, because they need, you know, to get to the coast. And that's sort of like their whole plan is to get out of L.A. Um, I like that it. it was funny, though, the zombies in this movie kind of reminded me, like, some of the makeup on them. Like, if you've seen, like, 70s and 80s Italian zombie movie makeup. And, and if you watch this, you know what I'm talking about. I think you will. I mean, if you watch those kind of movies. Like, there were some of them that were really good, but some of them that had that 70s zombie movie. I'm talking about, like, some of the weird ones, like a Ride Nights of the Living Dead kind of makeup or something. I don't know why I kept thinking that when I was looking at some of the makeup, but it had that kind of vibe to it. But it was actually pretty creepy. You know, I've been to L.A. a whole lot. It was just kind of cool to see the spots they shot it at and things like that. But I, I liked it. It's just, it's just a fun um, people trying to survive zombie movie. The next one is uh, The Anna Ferris Show with Alice and Jenny, the complete first season of Mom. And um, I think this was Chuck Lurie, I'm pretty sure. It uh, might be totally wrong, but I believe it's the person who did um, Two and a Half Men. I only really was interested in seeing this because I uh, pretty much watched everything with Anna Ferris, like ever since, you know, the first scary movie movie. And like one of my favorite ones that people don't even think of her from is, um, you know, May, which I think most people don't even remember she was in that. But this is pretty much about Anna Ferris, who is a recovering alcoholic, and she's got all kinds of problems with her mom, who she hasn't seen for years, it's kind of estranged from, ends up moving back in with their house, and Anna Ferris's daughter is pregnant. It's kind of about them all living together under one roof, having their all sort of sorts of problems and quirks and issues going on, and kind of the stuff that, you know, that happens with their lives and things like that. And on here has a um, gag reel, but if you're a fan of Anna Ferris, I would check this out. It's just a fun kind of sitcom show. Uh, the next one, which I just started looking at, um, is the complete first season of The 100 um, from Warner Brothers as well. And this, I think this is on the CW, and it's pretty much about, um, you know, in the future, you know, 100 years ago in the this, in this show that... Um, there was a nuclear attack, and everyone ended up having to leave Earth. Only, I think, 2,500 got away, and they were on these ships. But then they ended up all coming together in this thing called the Ark. And the Ark is kind of having a shortage of 
food and problems and things are going wrong in there. So they end up sending a hundred of these kids who are kind of like the bad kids there, who are like in like the juvenile detention center there, send them to Earth, put these things on them, the tracking bracelets, and kind of see if Earth is like habitable. But the um, you know the ship they go on gets screwed up along the way, so then they can't really f figure out how they're doing or even communicate with them. So the kids are kind of set, you know, to fend for themselves. The one kid in this was from um, Fun Size. A bunch of them were from other little things I've recognized. Um, I I like that. I I I'm, I think it's a pretty interesting thing. I always like these kind of things about people, you know, when they're all by themselves and trying to figure things out. But for what it is, I thought it was pretty interesting. Like I said, I'm still in the midst of watching that. Uh, the next one from Criterion, this is like such a weird movie that I've always really liked. And I feel like this is a movie too that's like the cause of a lot of people's bad dreams because it's such a creepy, weird movie with so many weird visuals that I think truly creep people out. Like to me, some of the aspects of this really creep me out. It has some cool features on this. Um, you, know, the, you know, of course the trailer, um, some making of things. And then one thing with David Lynch, which I love with him in the car, driving around with the main actor. And he's like talking about what do you eat lately? He's like, well, I eat turkey sandwiches and tuna melts. I don't know. I love. I like those kind of weird stuff like that. But it's David Lynch's Eraserhead, the Blu-ray from Criterion, which looks great. But the movie's a kind of very trippy movie about this guy who ends up getting his girlfriend pregnant, and the the mom, you know, for, forces him to get married to her, and um, you know, because she gave birth to the thing, and the birth is seriously deformed kind of, you don't even know if it's human, but it's the haunting of dreams, this thing. I mean, really creepy. And it's these weird visuals of him in this kind of apartment building with the baby and the weird stuff going on. And it's just such a creepy, like I said, I love David Lynch's movie. I think Wild at Heart is one of my favorites. It's one that people don't talk about as much, but I really love that one. Um, but this is just, like I said, it's just a black and white, amazing cinematography. Like I said, and the baby is just such a creepy thing in this. I can't recommend this one enough if you want to watch a really trippy, weird movie. Check this one out. And like I said, too, they did a great job pick, you know, cleaning this one up. Criterion always does a great job, though, with the picture. Uh, the next one from Lionsgate is the follow-up to, and this is the follow-up to the TV movie, the new one of Flowers in the Eye. This is Petals in the Wind. I still love the original, you know, the 80s one. Christy Swanson, the best. I mean, I know these ones are more to the book, but like, I really love that. I would always, always wish they made a sequel to the, you know, Flowers in the Attic, the original one. But this one, you know, has Ellen Burstyn and it. it's about the kids and kind of what happens to them after they've gotten. I mean, the thing is, you kind of ruin stuff about it, but you know they got out of the attic. To it, you know what I mean? But it's pretty much following them now, and then the grandmother comes back into their lives, and it's kind of about what's going on with them. But it's just not as to me like I really love the story of them in the attic and the whole vibe of it and the whole kind of what's going on and all that is to me a little bit more interesting than than the story that had happened in this one. But still, I think it's interesting just to actually see the, the other one. I think there's some other books as well. But, um, you know, well acted and everything, but just not as interesting of a story to me. Uh, the next one from Lionsgate is one that I was really surprised with how much I liked this. And there were some really funny, like, random cameos in it, like Alan Arkin. I don't even think he's credited as Alan Arkin. It's like another fake name, but... It was like, is that all he's doing? And he was like in it for like a minute. Uh, Bing Rames is in it, cameo. But uh, the star of this is Ethan Emery, who I've loved ever since Dutch. And, um, you know, Cleo Duvall, who I've always loved since. Um, but I'm a cheerleader and faculty, you know, books, tons of different things. But it's a movie about these two guys. And it kind of reminded me of that movie Kill the Man, which I don't think many people saw. But it's kind of about these two guys who run this... Um, uh, alarm business where they, you know, do home security and things like that, and they're having no luck with it. They're kind of like the laughing stock because there's a really popular security company nearby. The two friends, like ex people that they are kind of like their enemies from school work at, and things are not going well. So they come with this idea to start robbing houses to get people into, you know, to drum up business, and it's kind of about what has happened with that and. What's gone wrong with doing this and what is, you know, because they basically rob from the wrong person, it becomes a total nightmare. I thought this was really funny. Like I said, I'm a real, I really love Ethan Emery. I thought he was really good in this. I think it's a movie that not a lot of people are going to know about. And like I said, I was really surprised with how much I like it. This is one of my favorite things uh, in this update because I just, it kind of reminded me like of a 90s movie. Like I, 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 this is one of those movies too that I feel like I'll watch again like really soon just because I, I liked it. I just liked the vibe of this movie. 
Uh, the next one from Ario Video. This was not very good, and it's Iguana by Monty Hellman. Um, I really love, um, you know, the the lead in this. You know, Everett McGill. You know, from um, he was in Twin Peaks and People on the Stairs. I absolutely love him in. But this is such a weird movie, and it's Iguana, and it's about this guy who has a deformity on his face, and he kind of they call him Iguana, and he was on this ship, and I think he was it was a whaling ship, and he was kind of abused and made fun of by the people on the ship. He ends up, you know, escaping and going off into his own island and taking Michael Madison's character prisoner. And he's like, this is my island and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And he's doing this kind of peculiar British accent that's not that well done. He's like, you're going to do what I tell you to do. And you're, you're, if you're doing me wrong, I'll cut your fingers off. And all. It, it, It's just such a weird thing. And that's really what it is, is him taking prisoners and these long, drawn-out scenes and... Uh, it's such a disastrous movie. I don't. I can't say anything else about it. It's like, it's just. A, it's. It, I. I can't say anything else about it. Uh, the next one from Sony is the Calling. Um, and this is a Susan Tarantino film. This is kind of like a Fargo kind of movie. You know, of course, not as good as Fargo or anything, but because um, that's one of those movies. It's like a real perfect movie. But um, this is a was actually I actually like I was I got into this pretty much and it's about this small town and um, people are showing up dead and it's kind of about Susan Sarandon who's this cop who is kind of never kind of has alcohol problems and kind of issues and things like that and hasn't really done too much the whole town really has never really had much action and when this this these murders start happening Susan Sarandon wants to try and figure this out and wants to solve this case and it's kind of her trying to figure this out and figure out what all this means put the pieces together and uh, Topher Grace is in the movie comes as a cop who came from the city to kind of help as well but everyone around her is like doesn't believe that this is a serial killer and this is that they have a connection to these bodies but she's trying to prove that she's right and I liked it. I liked that you, you kind of see who the killer is a little early because they kind of show that he's toying with her. And I liked it. It has, like I said, it has that kind of vibe of like a Fargo kind of seven kind of thing. Of course, like I said, not a, a absolutely a standing movie or anything, but I thought Susan Sarandon was good in it. I liked it. I, I mean, I found it interesting. Uh, the next one is a Paul Haggis film from Sony as well, and this is Third Person. This is one of those movies, it's kind of like Crash, but just not as interesting to me. But it follows around a group of different people like, um, you know, uh, uh, it's um, Liam Neeson's character who's like this writer who's kind of shut himself away in uh, a hotel. Olivia Wilde who's like sleeping with him. And, you know, Liam Neeson it talks about his wife. And then it's like James Franco and, you know, his kind of stuff with his son. And everybody, they all kind of connect in a little bit. Some characters. And it's like the one guy, uh, Adrian Brody, ends up being this woman in the bar, and he finds out about what happened to the one with his her daughter, and then he kind of helps her. And it's like I said, it's all those movies that kind of connects a little bit. It was interesting. I just I couldn't get too much into this. I thought um, it was definitely more of a Liam Neeson going back to more of a dramatic. It's like he's got done way more action type movies nowadays, but. It was well acted and stuff. Like I said, I just couldn't get that much into it. But it has a commentary on here and a Q&A in the making of. The next one I got from Cynodyne is Delivery the Beast Within. Hopefully I don't mix these two up because they're both the same kind of concept about women, you know, pregnant and then things that are bad happening. But it's um, Delivery the Beast Within. And uh, now this one was about, um, you know, and I like the kind of idea about them it was this couple that was going on a show for like a kind of like a TLC kind of show about you know a mother you know family that's expecting a child who have kind of had problems conceiving and then kind of following them around and showing that and it kind of starts the first 30 minutes it plays just like it even shows like TVG the kind of sort of TLC kind of music and everything that shows kind of like that it's that kind of show then you find out that you know it cuts to the raw footage and it shows you know Things are very strange, but it's pretty much they end up, you know, thinking that they've lost the child when they're in the hospital because that's happened to them in the past, and the child is, you know, dead. They they, they find can't find a heartbeat, but then suddenly the next day she's the mom's like, can you check again? They find a heartbeat, and it's pretty much about the camera crew finding them around. Why you know things very strange things are happening and the weird way that she's acting and things like that. I thought it was actually a pretty effective found footage. I thought, like I said, the beginning really worked the best to me. But 
I like this. I thought that it was an interesting concept too, especially in the beginning, to make it really feel authentic to that kind of a thing. Um, like I said, I'm, these two are mishing together in my head a little bit, uh, which is a, which is a shame that they're kind of confusing me because they're like I said, I watched them like within days, and I kind of am mixing them up a little bit. I, I know I got that right, but the next one is from RLJ um, from Image, and it's the Devers Incarnate. And now this one was about. Uh, newlyweds that have just gotten married and end up going to, um, they're down in, I forget if it was in Florida, uh, and then they end up going to this kind of tarot card reader, and the tarot card reader starts freaking out when she sees the, um, the wife, and it, um, something ends up happening, and then they end up going back to their house, and I think they were, for some reason, were staying with their parents, or I think the parents were staying with them, but, and then the sister lives at the same house. I was always kind of confused about the living arrangements. I know it didn't matter. I kept thinking about, like, because they were all kind of living together, and I didn't really realize, like, the whole story behind all that, but pretty much what's happening is as soon as they get back, um, you know, they end up finding that she is pregnant, and she starts being very peculiar, and the sister is kind of thinking, noticing that there's something weird about it. The, the wife is even starting to kind of hit on the sister. And uh, the sister sort of has things for the wife. And it's this kind of weird things are going on because of this. And it's kind of like, is the woman, is she possessed? Is something going wrong? But, you know, something. I hope I didn't mix that up with the other one. But I don't think I did. Um, no, I didn't. I think because, yeah, this is the one with the guy that kind of looked like me from Catfish. That, that's how I'm not, I'm, I'm telling you guys, I, two of them are so similar, I'm, like, I don't want to mix them up. I mean, they're very different, but there's, like, the idea of the kid and everything going on. Um, no, but this one, I actually think I like this one better than the other one. Um, and the outcome of this one is pretty creepy, too, because, like, the thing with the, the wife kept on getting worse and worse. Um... The next one from uh, Millennium is Are You Here? And it's um, Zach Galifianakis, Owen Wilson, and Amy Poehler. And um, Zach Galifianakis and Owen Wilson, you know, a few friends have lived together for a long time. Uh, Owen Wilson is a news anchor uh, doing sports. And Zach Galifianakis is kind of living like at home, not really doing anything. Ends up finding out that his father passed away. And he wants Owen Wilson to come with him and go back to their old town. When they go out there, you know, he finds out that Zach Galifianakis was given all this um, money and, you know, Amy Poehler is going to kind of fight him for it. And he has this kind of idea of what he wants to do with this money and kind of all these kind of things that he wants to do. Um, it's one of those movies that I, it just, to me, did not work too well. Really didn't end up being that funny. And that's pretty much all that it really is. And it's like sort of a love story, too, with Owen Wilson and uh, Zach Galifianakis' ex, you know, the wife of the father who died, who was way younger, and it's it's just not a not an outstanding movie. Um, it just wasn't. Uh, the next one from um, Star Vista, you know, from Time Life, is Motown Twenty um, Fifth, Yesterday, Today, and Forever. And this is this is pretty cool. It has a lot of performances on here from Stevie Wonder, uh, Marvin Gaye, Michael Jackson. Uh, you know, the Jackson Five actually has him when he did the first Moonwalk. You know, the very first time that he did that. Um, I think this was on, you know, NBC, you know, for a number of years. Never, you know, saw, I don't think, this is another one that I don't think has been rerun a whole lot. At least that I don't remember seeing. I remember seeing some clips of it, but like never the full episodes and things like that. But it has Lionel Richie on here. This is just a cool, like, performance show. Um, the next one from, um, Mill Creek is, um, Kroll. Um, this is one I had ne never watched before, and this is kind of like a, you know, I think this is one of Liam Neeson's first movies, he was in it a little bit, it's about, um, you know, in this kingdom, you know, they're getting married, and the one wife ends up getting taken away by these aliens, and it's kind of about him going after them and trying to find them, um, this was okay, this, I, I couldn't get too much into this, um, the next one from, um, uh, well Go USA is American Muscle, and I like this because it had it had um, Nick Principal, and this is the lead, and he's you know he's been in lots of movies, but I think this is one of his first movies when he was like the main lead, I, you know, and I thought he, thought he did a really good job in this, you know, he played um, you know the killer and laid to rest, um, but this was like to me I thought he did a really good job because it was a little bit more of like a real serious role, and he carried the whole movie. This guy who ended up you know arrested in jail and. You know, he's gotten out of jail, and he has this kind of plan to get revenge on everyone that put him away. And it's pretty much just him going on the spree of killing people uh, along the desert and trying to track down his old girlfriend, 
who you know he wants to get because of what she's she had something to do with him being put away. I like this one. It's just a pretty much a payback revenge film. Uh, it was pretty fun and pretty well done as a commentary on here with the director. Uh, the next one I covered the picture, so nobody has says anything about it. This is from Wild Eye releasing. This was really pretty good. Um, and it's Play Hooky. Polygram, Polygram presents this one. And this is a really good found footage movie. Uh, one that I would definitely recommend you guys check this out. Um, another one of my favorite ones in this. And it was really, you know, really extremely low budget, but well-made movie about a group of these kids who are playing hooky from school. And they're kind of going, sort of screwing around. It really feels like a video blog. And it's kind of like them just going out, hanging around the park, screwing around. And they come up with the idea of going to this old abandoned uh, mental asylum place. And they end up pretty much, you know, seeing the security guard out front. And he's like, you better get out of here. And why aren't you at school? And they end up, you know, waiting for him to leave and then sneaking into this place. And, of course, when they go in there, the door gets jammed. They get stuck in this place. And they just sort of screw around partying. But they end up finding out that there's someone else in this place. And it's pretty much a not a good person and not a good thing that's happened. But it's just, to me, it was a really effective found footage movie. I think they said it was all shot on the flip. But I feel like the dark levels and the picture was, I don't know if it really was shot on the flip because it looked too good. Unless it was like they just knew how to light it well. But to me, this was an effective found footage one. And the next one from uh, Wild Eye Releasing as well is Swamp Head. This has a really pretty cool cover on this. And this is about pretty much a killer head, like this head that's kind of haunting the swamp. Um, this was okay. There were some funny aspects in this, but about a group of these people out in the swamp getting kind of attacked by the swamp head. Um, there was some funny stuff in this. It was kind of like a throwback to like a shot on video kind of movie. But it's one of those kind of movies that I thought loses steam. Like I said, the wild one that I really liked was the pop, you know, play hooky. But there was some crazy stuff in this, some crazy gore effects and things like that. The next one from um, Mill Creek is um, Neighbors, which is, just, I'm glad this is actually out now on official pressed uh, DVD. It was out on a DVD-R from the Warner Archive, but now it's out on an actual pressed disc. Uh, this is a movie I feel like not many people saw, uh, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd movie. It's a very quirky, uh, weird movie about Dan Aykroyd and his wife. Um, you know, Dan Aykroyd, who moves in next door to John Belushi's character, and Dan, you know, he's such a strange guy, and very peculiar, and things like that. John Belushi really can't stand him, and he pretty much just invites himself over for dinner, and, um, and, and there's, like, weird stuff about, like, him talking about going to pick up food, and he just goes into his kitchen and makes it himself, and still charges John Belushi, and just... It's pretty just about like weird things going on and kind of always showing up and like all takes place in one night. It's just a very quirky, weird movie. Kind of like the Burbs kind of had that kind of vibe. You know, Burbs came later, but it kind of had the same kind of feel to it. But it's one of my favorite Dan Aykroyd movies, especially because like no one talks about it. It's just a fun, weird film. Uh, the next one from RO Video is um, The Stunt Squad. And this is about... All of, you know, in this uh, the city, there's all these kind of bombings going around, and it's kind of like um, they're doing putting like bombs in phones. So if you call the phone, the bomb blows up, and it's happening all over the city in stores and all kinds of places. And it's a group of the um, they put together this kind of stunt squad to try and stop the people behind this. It's a pretty fun movie. I thought my favorite stuff about this though was the music. It has some really pretty cool. Uh, synth and like old 70s kind of music that I always love, that kind of music. Um, but this, that's pretty much what it was. It was a pretty cool movie though. Uh, and you know, both, both that and Iguana from our both look very well. They do, they do a good job cleaning up their movies and they don't like, they like leave it so it still has the 70s vibe. They don't like over clean it up. Uh, the next one from Mill Creek as well is TV Guide Spotlight. And this is a uh, set with 13 episodes and it's all um, Halloween themed episodes, you know, Halloween episodes from shows like Bewitched, uh, Married Children, The Jeffersons, Roseanne, Third Rock from the Sun. I always like these kind of sets when they have, you know, theme to like Christmas and Halloween and all the episodes together. The Roseanne ones, I always think of that, the Halloween one. But anyway, though, that was all for this DVD Blu ray update. Thanks again for watching and subscribing, guys, and I'll see you guys later.